So the UNM Engineering Student Success Center asked me to present a brief history of computer science because I used to be a UNM computer science professor and because I'm old. And today I'm going to focus on the old stuff. When we get to PCs and smartphones, I'll leave it up to you. Now, they told me I should be lighthearted and fun like a one-man John Oliver show. Here goes. <laughs> Wait. The history of computer science. The history of computer science, for the most part, is the history of digital computing, which begins with the breakthrough discovery of the digits. They're great for counting things, and they come in fives and tens, which is just the way we like to count. Incredible luck or alien influence? You decide. In any case, counting is good for lots of things. Like to count up how much you owe me, says the king, the high priest, the local big shot. And don't you forget it. And, and that was actually a problem with early digital computing. Fingers were convenient, but you couldn't count very high unless you had lots of friends. And the counts kept getting erased when you decided to use your fingers for something else. But <clears throat> information technology research and development was on the job. Counting on fingers led to using pebbles or sticks or stones or shells to keep the count and coming up with all sorts of tally marks like these modern ones. Look at those cute little hands. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And check out these marks that were scratched into the leg bone of a baboon 20,000 years ago. That's persistent memory. Now, granted, this may not be the baboon's favorite memory technology, but there were more innovations to be had, like clay. It's easy to mark on wet clay, then let it dry. If you wanted to, you could wet it again and smooth it over like a Sumerian etch-a-sketch. But if you cooked it in a hot oven, the clay tablet turned to frickin' stone, and the royals and accountants everywhere like that a lot. And the resulting persistent memory market was basically owned by Big Clay for centuries, and Clay got used for everything. Like this from 5,000 years ago. What was important enough to bake this tablet? Beer. Who gets the beer? Well, I don't care if your uncle is Sargon of Akkad. It says right here you only get one vessel of beer. Good day, sir. Or this little note. It's three, three or 4,000 years old. It's a customer complaint letter, and you thought it was tough dealing with Wells Fargo. Uh, uh, yada, but friend of Nusenda. So, counting up is great, and write once memory is great. But for more complex math, we really want persistent but rewritable memory. And progress marches on. With this sturdy wooden counting frame, you can write and rewrite numbers all day long. Or check out this streamlined monster. It's got like 17 hands. One, two, three, four, five, f one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, whoa, how does it work? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Counted to nine with one hand. Uh, I use these fingers twice. Can't do that with right once memory. So with a device like this, if you knew the bead twiddling rules and the algorithm, you could do complicated things like multiplication, which is good for figuring out how much everybody owes me all at once. So put the memory device together with the instructions and you get a digital computer, right? Well, not quite. You have to plug them into a human or they don't work. Memory by itself is just all passive digressive. I'm just repeating what you told me. And the rules just give orders. You do this, you do that. The rules never do anything themselves. So we need something else to examine the situation, make a decision, and then turn the crank and move on. It seemed obvious that there were only two choices. Teach a human the rules and have them do whatever it is, or design the rules explicitly into the machine up front so it can't not do them, but then the rules can't be changed later. And that was the great split in digital computing. You could build machines and then try to make them flexible, or you could deploy on humans and then try to keep control. Opportunities and risks either way. 
Now, when humans are writing rules for other humans, it, things can get really complicated really fast. And in some ways, that's the history of science. People programming people is also culture and parenting and law, but people programming people to do math, physics, science has proved to be especially powerful. Royalty likes that. Now, the math humans did kind of get into sort of arms races with each other about notation, trying to pack the most power into the shortest program and utterly baffling everybody else in the process. Oh, I know that one. Uh, uh, uh no. <laughs> Uh, who knows? Now, there were also many efforts over the centuries to make automatic deciders of increasing flexibility and speed. Here's the Pascaline of 1652, an adding machine uh, designed by Blaise Pascal. And people made automata, machines that moved on their own and sort of acted like alive. They weren't really ever useful, but then a lot of them were made to please the royalty. This is a view of Vaucanson's digesting duck from 1739, which appeared to eat grain, drink water, and poop. Uh, the mechanical Turk claimed to be a chess-playing machine built to impress Maria Theresa, the Empress of Austria, it played chess really well, but it was a fake with a human chess player hidden inside as the decider. It toured for decades anyway. In Japan, there was a long tradition of karakuri puppet automata that did things like move and bow to serve tea. Yes, rich people bought them. On the other hand, the Jacquard loom of 1804, which could weave intricate patterns from punch card programs, was a success indeed. By 1812, there were 11,000 of them at work in France. And by the way, the Jacquard machine design built on previous loom work by, among others, Vaucanson, the digesting duck guy. Incredible luck or alien influence? You decide. Here's a look at the programming cards, and here's the man himself, not in a lithograph or in etching, but woven in silk using 24,000 punch cards on a Jacquard loom. Charles Babbage, sometimes called the father of the computer, owned one of these silks and was reputedly inspired by it. So over the centuries, there was progress on the quest for flexibility and fast mechanized deciders and development of the programming languages they accepted. We even started to get software documentation. And all the digital computing concepts had been in the air one way or another since the beginning. As much as anything, it was a matter of multiple technologies maturing plus the will, the investment, and the audacity to make it all work. Several machines can claim to be the first electronic computer, depending on what's considered essential. In Bletchley Park, north of London, the Colossus Mark II was built specifically for code breaking. The ENIAC, funded by the U.S. Army and built at the University of Pennsylvania, was more flexible than Colossus, but programming it involved physically recabling and rebuilding parts of it and took a long time. But after that, it could do a thousand editions, five thousand editions every second. And over the next couple of decades, electronic computing exploded around the world. The U.S. Army funded several more machines, with pieces of them shown here from the left, aboard from the ENIAC, the EDVAC, the ORDVAC, and the Burlesque One on the right. And just to be clear, the folks holding the boards are mathematicians, programmers, project staff. Badass nerds in heels. And it was an age, a time of fantastic progress for the math humans, too. There was finally a non-human machine with great rule-following flexibility and reliability. Thousands of algorithms and variations were explored. Just to pick one out of the hat, the Patricia Tree algorithm was created by Don Morrison, who was a member of the UNM Computer Science Department way back in 1968. Com commercial computing was on the rise as well. Uh, uh, big machines epitomized by the IBM System 360, which debuted in 1965. 
<clears throat> and this is a DEC System 10, my favorite computer of all time. Not this exact one, but I've loved a few. Uh, uh, the DEC 10 was one of the first popular time-sharing uh, machines, so that a lot of people could use a piece of a machine they'd never be able to afford all on their own. I loved learning how to use it, and I'm sorry, but Tico is still the most awesome text editor ever. Fight me. Uh, uh, program, I love programming it too, and I did it a lot. And it, this great job I had as an undergrad was being a system operator for a DEC 10. I didn't dwell on it at the time, but, you know, this was a huge, magnificent machine. Uh, like most mainframes, it had a private room all its own. Really, it wasn't in the room so much as it was the room, the machine room. Thick doors, always locked, raised white panel floors with cables running in every direction underneath, smooth, even lighting, AC humming, always cool. The printer chattering as the next job came out, the blinking lights on the main console right out of Star Trek. Usually not that much to do unless there was some problem there. Then cabinet after blue cabinet of main memory. Each one holding, I think, about a megabyte, although deck, the Deck 10 didn't count bytes quite the way we do now. And then further back, the tape drives that would meet you face to face as you change the reels for one of the users or another. And there were always users, 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 day or night, packed cheek to jowl inside the memory of this incredible machine, doing homework, playing games, analyzing physics experiments, or just messing around to see the, with the machine to see what it could do. I did some of that. You know, Colossus didn't have to worry about randos trying to provoke it into doing something weird. Neither did ENIAC. And getting everything perfectly safe turned out to be kind of hard. We haven't figured it out yet. And the locks and the thick doors kind of missed the point. It's really about the cables from all over campus converging under the white panel raised floor and punching straight up into the brainstem of the machine. So it's usernames and passwords, special operator privileges, hierarchy was imposed, but no matter. The machine utterly trusted its program. That's the source of its flexibility, and it could not do otherwise. The brief age of secure computing was over. The Deck 10s lasted into the 80s, which was a good run for uh, at the rate machines were evolving. Uh, one was, in fact, decommissioned while I was in grad school. It was one of my, my treasured possessions. Uh, uh, it wasn't security problems uh, so much as just the company wanted to concentrate on its newer VAC system. Uh, um, but things were changing in lots of ways anyway. So... That's it. Uh, I didn't want to end on a downer note, uh, uh, but the quest for the fully automated, totally flexible mechanical decider really has succeeded too well. We need to focus on robustness. So I published this argument in, in 2013. The future of computer science is robust first. And, you know, of course, the consensus now on the lessons of uh, 2026 is that, you know, we pretty solidly missed robust first, but, you know, robust later is better than robust never. Wait, what year is this? Thank you. Any questions?